Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Theology Central Radio, where I walk down into the dusty archives, I look around, I find an old message, I blow off all the dust, I I bring it back upstairs, and then while I go live and while we listen to one of the old messages and the ever-expanding Theology Central archives at Theology Central Library, and hopefully these older messages prove to be somewhat beneficial. In this episode of the Theology Central Radio, we're going to go back to May the 6th, 2019, May the 6th, 2019. Now, when I, when I pulled this one out of the archives, I started thinking, wow, I remember way back then. I, who knew how, how much everything was going to change? And when I think about it, it is absolutely irritating. It is absolutely frustrating to me how much the pandemic absolutely disrupted preaching, teaching, and so many other things when it comes to the church. Now, I I know that that is the most insignificant part of the pandemic. The people dying and suffering obviously is the bigger issue. But from just looking back and you're like, okay, because on May the 6th, 2019, I believe this was the second hour, the first hour, I think during Sunday school, I did kind of my pre- my pre-message, right? Because we were about to kick off a series in the book of Romans. So I took the first hour and man, did I just, whoo, there was some fire in that. I was, I just, you could say it was mean. You could say it was harsh. You could say it was blunt. It it definitely wasn't probably nice. The first hour was was really like, hey, if we're going to really study this book, then either you take it serious, you do the work or just be quiet because you're going to find something to disagree with. You're going to find, you know, you're either going to actually put in the time and effort. And so I, yeah, probably it it, it was, it was, it was strong. Maybe we'll, we'll play that uh, for some episode of Theology Central Radio. But the next hour, I took a deep breath. I calmed down and I'm like, all right, guys, we're about to begin a long journey through the book of Romans. And this was Romans Overview Part 1, where we begin to do an overview of the book, try to establish what the book is about. And then, well, we we never really, if you think about it, we never really finished the book of Romans. We got to what, chapter 10, chapter 9, chapter 10, somewhere along that line. And we took a massive detour in our study of law and gospel. So like we, we, we work through Romans chapter one, Romans chapter two, Romans chapter three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I think somewhere in chapter eight, nine or 10, somewhere along those lines, then we took a detour to law and gospel, which was very much relevant. And then we spent 70, 80, 90 hours in law and gospel. In fact, in some ways that's still ongoing because we still talk about things related to that. And we can still do more in that series as well. But this is how it, this is not the official start. Again, the first hour on May the 6th, 2019 is where uh, I really kicked it off. And I, again, that was, I, I don't know if I regret how I kicked it off or I don't know if I think I did the right thing. You can always, you know, second guess yourself. But the next hour, I did my traditional kind of overview of the book to get it started. So we're going to go back and do that. Now, what I was saying as far as being frustrating or irritating is, you know, this was 2019. We were beginning a new series and who knew that in, you know, that once the pandemic happened, everything was going to be disrupted. Whatever you were trying to preach or teach, it got messed up or then it was just, it was crazy. And I, I sometimes, even though I know it's 2024, I don't know if anything has ever, will ever, will, will anything ever go back to normal? I, I don't know. I don't know. I think many churches, I think many churches are still struggling with, will ever, will anything ever be the same? And I don't know if it will ever be the same. I think uh, church members have different expectations. I think church members, their attitude about attendance uh, was greatly impacted. I think I think so much uh, changed uh, from that. We could do an entire you know broadcast about all the the lingering effects 
Do we call it long COVID? I know there's a medical long COVID. Do we call it a spiritual long COVID? All the the, lo- the lasting effects of the COVID pandemic from, you know, in, in churches and just church members themselves and how they perceive church. I think that could be interesting. I don't know if we could be dogmatic about anything. We could offer a lot of speculation, but there's no speculation about this. In this episode of Theology Central Radio, we travel back to May the 6th, 2019, Victory Baptist Church in the middle of nowhere, Texas. I stand behind the pulpit. We begin an overview of the book of Romans. Now, buckle in. <laughs> this is a long message, okay? This is a, the one thing, the one thing about Victory Baptist Church is I've never had to worry about time. I've never, the only, yeah, I, I could tell a, a story about time. I, I could, um, well, I'll, I'll do this really quick. When I was, I was still, still, I mean, it was, you know, Victory Baptist Church was my first church, my only church, will be my only church, because when I started, when, when I was called out there to become the pastor, I said, you know, this is it. This is going to be my church. This is it. As long as there's one person here, I'm, I won't leave. I'm not going to just leave you in the middle and say, oh, God called me to go to this place or this place. This is the place I am. I'm going to do my best and I'm going to give myself to, to this work. And I did that 23, 24 years later. You know, and maybe all be coming, it may all be coming to an end this year, but 23, 24 years later, I've done as much as I can. But when I was very, very early on, now I did not realize this at the time, but there's a lots of statistical studies that say when a new pastor comes in, right? Even if it's a brand new church or if it's an established work, when a new pastor comes in, usually within six months to a year, he's going to lose 30, 40, 50% of the people there because they're going to be like, well, I don't like this person. I don't, and that, and while well, I started experiencing that very early on, I had, oh, there was, <laughs> there was some people who, uh, who they, at first they were like, yes, we want you. And they turned, they turned against me really, really, really quick at the very beginning. And it was very frustrating because, you know, it was a small work to start off with, but ultimately it worked out because we lost about 30, 40% of people. And then we went through a great time of growth and then everything was great. And then it's been a steady decline. It's just, you know, the way churches work, but there was this one individual She did not like me at all. She was furious with me about so many things. And one of the things she complained about, one of her complaining is that we spend way too much time preaching and not enough time singing, right? She wanted me to increase it. And I'm like, okay, well, if you want, we can do an hour of singing and an hour of preaching. Well, that didn't make her happy either. Whether she wanted just less preaching. But so now what I, now this was foolish of me. It wasn't really my intention but for, I don't remember what happened that particular Sunday. I think it was Resurrection Sunday. Some call it Easter Sunday. I, I think for some reason we didn't have Sunday school or something where we're just going to have one service. So because I didn't have that extra hour of teaching, I tried to cram everything into that, that hour. Now I was, you know, young, I hadn't been preaching very long. So I kind of, I kind of, it kind of got away from me. Right. And I ended up preaching for an hour and 30 minutes. One hour and 30 minutes, and that was the end of that family. <laughs> they they never came back. It wasn't my intention. It, it may have felt intentional because they, you know, complained, and then I drop an hour and 30 minutes of, of preaching. Probably shouldn't have done it that way. It just really, I lost control of the, like, I just lost control of time and, and didn't have it measured out very well and planned out. But I mean... I know, I know it's a shock, but sometimes people don't have much grace <laughs> or compassion for someone who may be doing their very best and just lost track of time. You're just, you're, you're really getting into what you're trying to do. And you're like, we've got to finish this. Now, you know, when you, when you've been preaching much longer, you're like, you know what, whether we finish it, we don't finish it. I'll just stop there. Nobody really cares anyway. Okay. All right. Maybe you just become more jaded. But here we go. This was May the 6th, 2019. The book of Romans. I hope this proves to be beneficial. Here we go. All right. Let's get started. We have a lot to do. Let's do a quick review. Early 
um, the first hour this morning, we looked at this concept of contrasting milk Christian with a meat Christian, a car, using the term carnal Christian. Remember, there's, there's some qualifications there before we can say a carnal Christian. Understand that, okay. Um, the idea of a carnality or more fleshly-minded Christian versus a spiritual Christian, a babe or immature Christian versus a mature Christian, all right? And I, and I really challenged us as a church to really look at ourselves, to go, where do we classify ourselves? Where are we really at, okay? And, the, and, and there was a number of reasons for doing that, but one of the primary reasons for doing that was that was to lay a foundation for where we are going. And the way I tried to get us to where we're going is we took a detour to 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's go back there. 2 Peter chapter 3. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3. Tell me when you're there. All right. Um, make sure I'm on the right uh, page. Look at verse uh, 14. Yeah, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. And I know the verse starts with wherefore, just like I said this morning, but I don't want to get into everything. I'm just going to try to set this up. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto you, hath written unto you. Implication, Paul had written something in regards to salvation. All right? That's kind of the basic simplistic um, surface level, right? Everybody okay with that? As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things which are some things Hard to be understood. Now stop right there. Milk Christians are unskilled in the word of God, so things that are hard to understand are not really for milk Christians. That's why Paul would say, there's things I cannot speak to you because you're not able. You can't deal with these things. So if we're going to go to one of Paul's epistles, we have to be prepared that we have to be more meat type Christians, spiritual, or we're going to prove to be unskilled and unable to handle what we will find in an epistle of Paul. Does that make sense? Okay. And what's the warning here? These things are difficult to understand, but what's, are are things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, there's kind of a, a correlation there. If we go back to looking at uh, the milk type Christian and, and the carnal type Christian and those types of things. Unlearned and unstable, they rest or wrestle as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So there is a, there is a, there's a, there is levels of ability in handling the scriptures. Again, I know that goes against the Protestant idea, but this is a biblical idea. You are either skilled or unskilled. You are either spiritually minded or you're fleshly minded. You're either a meat Christian or you are a milk Christian. So I went hard on that subject in the first hour. With uh, lots of offense to everyone. I did that, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to post the sermon because after having a conversation with someone in a different state this afternoon about things that are going on, and uh, talk, we talked about the church and a lot of things, I'm like, maybe a lot of people need this. Um, I'm just going to have to record an uh, introduction giving a, a you know, warning. The following message will offend you. Okay, okay. okay. You will be offended, okay? But... Um, We'll see. I'm gonna. I'm probably going to post it, but because it's critical, I think, to set the foundation for what we're getting ready to do. All right. So, with all of that said, we're obviously getting ready to begin a journey through one of Paul's epistles. All right. But before we get there, they made an argument that there are things in there that are hard to understand. Agreed. That's what Peter says. There's things that are hard to understand. So I want to get just a brief reminder of this. I kind of made a reference to it this morning. Now I'll kind of flesh it out a little bit. Anytime you open the pages of your Bible, 
right? You are opening a book that we believe is the revelation from God. Complete, closed, nothing can be added, nothing can be taken away. And when we begin to read it and study it and care about it, it begins to give us understanding. And it gives us understanding um, and the following important things, okay? There's three important things that the, all scriptures give us understanding to. Number one, they give us an understanding of who God is. All right? It gives us an understanding of God. I, I wrote this down. As I begin to study the Bible and read the Bible, I begin to see God and understand God as he is. And as I begin to see God as he is, it allows me to understand everything else as it is is understanding of God is literally foundational to understanding everything else. This is why theology used to be the most important subject taught, right? Remember, what were the two key subjects taught throughout uh, the last 2,000 years? Theology and philosophy, theology and philosophy, theology and philosophy, theology and philosophy, okay? That's because that's, that's the way, I mean, Christians are supposed to be that way, right? We understand God, and then we take that understanding of God, which then gives us the ability to understand everything else, <laughs> right? So that, that's, I cannot stress this. So we begin with God. We ha- Whenever I open the Bible, we begin to understand God. Keep that in mind, because this is going to lay, remember, Peter is telling us there's something in Paul, every and all of Paul's epistles, there are things that are hard to understand. So we need to know when we open the Bible what the Bible is giving us clear understanding about because this lays a foundation when we get to those things that are hard to understand. Does that make sense? Okay. So God, we, when we open the Bible, we begin to get an understanding of God. The Bible is really a revelation about God. Once we get an understanding of God, then we begin an understanding of of everything else. So let me say that again. As I understand who God is, this allows me to understand everything as it truly is. You remove a right understanding from God, your understanding of everything is wrong. Your theology determines your ability to understand everything. <laughs> Wrong theology, everything else falls apart. Does that make sense? All right. The second thing is ourselves. When we open the Bible, we discover ourselves as we truly are. But we cannot see ourselves as we truly are until we understand God as he truly is. Okay? This is like Christianity 101. Okay? If you want to understand yourself, you got to start with God. You understand God, you understand yourself. You don't understand yourself as you perceive yourself. You don't understand yourself the way you want to be. You begin to see yourself as you really are. Right? So far, so good. All right. Number three. You begin to understand the world around you. And when I say the world, you're speaking of the physical creation and the philosophical system. Because the world is a physical thing and it is a philosophical thing. All right? When I open the Bible, I begin to understand who God is. This gives me the ability to see myself as I truly truly am. And then guess what that allows me to do? To see the world as it is. I I begin to have a correct understanding of creation in the environment and nature. Not a warped one, warped by politicians. And when I say that, I'm not saying by liberal politicians. I'll say by conservative politicians who have just as a warped view about it as liberals do. You have to have a biblical one. And the world is more than just the physical planet. The world has a philosophical climate that permeates and 
infiltrates and affects every aspect of our thinking. Christians can understand that when we understand God. Does that make sense? Yes? All right. So, um, when you take those three things, God, ourselves, and the world, the Bible gives me an understanding. We can replace, when we begin to understand God, we begin to understand uh, ourselves and begin to understand our world, we'll realize that this leads to a, two, three foundational ideas. The holiness of God, that, that explains who God is, right? The sinfulness of man, that begins for us to see ourselves as we truly are. And then, salvation, which deals with what? Salvation deals with the salvation of our soul, deals with the salvation of the world, right? Because God will redeem and cre- bring about a new creation, correct? And he'll, they'll bring about a salvation of obviously the wrong philosophies will be destroyed and will all be made right in the image of God and will be as he is. Does that make sense? There'll be a restoration, a redeeming of everything. Okay, so that's what happens when you open the Bible. So whenever we go to Paul's epistle, that Peter seems to warn us is going to be what? There's going to be things in it that are going to be difficult to understand. We can go back and stay, say, go, okay, this is the difficult part. What do I learn about God? What do I learn about myself? What do I learn about world, the world? Do I see anything about holiness? Do I see anything about sinfulness? And do I see anything about salvation? Does that make sense? Right? That's a, that's a, a very, that was supposed to take an hour, so I did that like in five minutes, but you get the idea. Right? That could take two hours to break that down. That lays the foundation. Now, the epistle... The, the book that we're going to look at is the book of Romans. All right? Now, I said it this morning. Let me say it again. The book of Romans, the only way I can illustrate this is I believe the book of Romans to be the unwinnable test in uh, the Star Trek TV series and the Star Trek movie. All right? There's a test there that, that you know, you're supposed to be able to pass to become a captain, but the test, I think if I remember correct, it was created by Spock for no one to be able to beat. No one was able to, supposed to overcome it. Kirk, uh, captain Kirk figures it out, and the reason he figures it out is he's like, well, if this is unwinnable, then I'll just do nothing. He realizes it. In my estimation, the book of Romans is unwinnable in this particular way. It deals with subjects that have completely split, split Christianity, cause you to spit too, okay, uh, creates a split within Christianity. And I think the reason it creates such a split is because Peter warns us there are some things in it that are difficult to understand. And guess what? If you open the book of Romans and you are a carnal milk baby Christian, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be unskilled and unable to figure it out. So we're going to have to approach it in a very careful way. There are controversial doctrines all over the place. All right? It's filled with controversial things. You're going to have to set aside, like, you can't get so bothered by it because it doesn't go along with what you think. You've got to challenge yourself to work through it. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm not going to go through all the things, but we know we're walking right into subjects like election. We're walking uh, right into the subjects dealing with Israel. We're just walking into a mess. All right. It's like a, it's like a minefield littered uh, with explosives. And it's just waiting to see how many casualties there will be before we are done. Okay. It's not easy. I know most pastors approach it, this is the most amazing book ever. This book will bring about a revival in the lives of all people. And I'm like, well, look at all the divisions it's caused. Like, I, I guess I always look at it from a negative perspective, but I think I've got a lot of history to prove it. Okay. So our approach to this is going to be, um, we're not going to approach it in a milk way, because I don't do that. So we're not going to do four weeks through the book of Romans, because that's just a joke. Um, We're not going to approach it where I just break each section. Uh, Chapter 1, verses 1 through 7 is introduction. Here's the four parts of the introduction. You know, blah, blah. 
blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I can do it in my sleep. Okay, I don't want to play that game. We're going to do what? We're going to dig in. And we're going to do so, we're going to use a lot of different methods. Right? Sometimes it's going to be academic struggling through an issue, but if the text presents an issue, then we've got to work through the issue. There will be times it may be more devotional. There are times it may be more three-point outline. I doubt it, but we'll see. Okay? But we're going to work through it. Now, we're going to start our way through the book by go ahead and grab the Bible dictionaries. We're already going to start in a way that most churches don't because I'm supposed to right here to give you a... I call them hype introductions. Um, this is where pastors introduces a book, and the purpose of introducing the book is to get people excited about the book and to try to convince everyone that they should study it. I, I don't think I should have to convince you to study it because it's in God's Word. And if you're a Christian, you should desire it. I don't have to give you the desire. If you don't have the desire, then that isn't evidence you're not a Christian, right? It's in God's Word. Okay? And I also am very leery of hyping the book, making it sound like it's more important than all the other books. Almost all the commentaries act like Romans is the, it's the greatest of the greats. This is the book. And in fact, many of them will say the most important book. And no, I, I, dis, I, dis, I completely disregard and disagree with that idea. And here's the reason why. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof. I will argue Genesis is foundational to understanding the rest of the Bible. It's not more important. Romans is foundational to understanding salvation and understanding many ideas, but it's not more important. It just serves maybe as a foundational role. Does that make sense? All right. I, I, I don't like that idea. I read way too many commentaries and introductions and listened to too many introductional sermons this week on this book. And I was like, I'm not going to, appro- I'm not going to approach it at all that way. I'm not going to approach it all this way. And one of the things that motivated me to go to the book of Romans, just to remind everyone, is because of the sermon preached by the president of the Southern Baptist Convention on Romans chapter 1. He preached it on January... I think 29, I think January 29, 2019, um, and which created major controversy, I guess somewhere in February, and then it kind of, the controversy went away, and for some reason, it came back May something, 2019, I guess people just discovered it, and uh, I think some of the controversy is unwarranted, and it just reminded me, maybe people are showing they're unskilled in how to handle the book. So if I hear uns- uh, an unskilled approach to the book, then I feel motivated to try to demonstrate that we can be skilled in our handling of it. All right. So let's grab our Bible dictionaries. Everyone seems to already have theirs open. Nelson's new illustrated Bible dictionary. Now, remember, we're going to be working through this. Please, if I stop, don't keep reading because then, you're, and then I, I'll just wait till you get done reading and then we can talk. Or let me try to explain, because I may be deviating from what the dictionary says. So if you're not listening to me, then you miss everything that I just possibly corrected from the dictionary. Does that make sense? Okay. Because what do we, what's the number one thing we look at when we open the Bible dictionary? What's the number one thing we need to be concerned with or worried about? When it, when it goes from being factual to offering an interpretation. You have to know that, like same way in, an, in a news article. What was that study? Um, it's like 82% of people can't read a news ar- article and determine what's fac- a factual statement versus what's an opinion statement. And I'm like, well, then, like, we're in trouble. Okay? Like, you should be able to do that. Okay? The same thing with a dictionary. Just because it's in a dictionary doesn't mean it's all, it doesn't mean it's all fact-based. It means some of it is, Opinion based. And what, what's the first example of what could be opinion based? Looking at the entry for Romans, what's the very first thing you see? It's a big yellow. The outline. Outlines typically be are typically what? It typically is interpretive, not informative. It's interpreting the way because they're structuring Romans in the way that they think 
Oh, this emphasizes this. And many of their points are very much more an interpretation of what that is about, not necessarily an agreed. That's why are all outlines the same? No, not even close. So you've got, to be, you've got to even be careful with that. But let's see how they start. I know we did this this morning, but now we, I, I think we put it all together and wrapped it in a nice little bow, right? It's all good to go? All right, here we go. Let's begin. Romans, epistle to thee. The most formal and systematic of Paul's epistles. Now stop right there. Now this is very important because this gives you a hermeneutical clue. Right? I'm getting ready to read a book that's formal. Seth said it this morning. What does that mean? It's not going to be personal in nature. It's going to be formal. It's going to be a very formal, in other words, it's going to deal with ideas, doctrines, and theologies, not so much from a personal issue perspective, but on a theological perspective. It's going to be formal in its nature, not personal. Next, now, what is, that may be the most important. That's making the argument that the book is what? What, what does it mean to be systematic? S- step by step by step, a logical progression, a systematic progression of idea and thought. That means if a pastor, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, preaches something from Romans 1, I got to be careful because I would have to go back and listen to all of his sermons leading up to that point to see, is he, is he, did he pick up Paul's argument correctly? And then is he, did he carry Paul's uh, thought to a logical conclusion or did the logical conclusion break down? Does that make sense? Systematic teaching requires that everyone listening is following the flow of thought. If you're not listening to the flow of thought, you're ignoring the system, and then you hear a sermon, you'll begin to argue, and I'm like, can you give me how we got here? Why well, I haven't been paying attention or listening. Well, then you can't. You've got to pick up the systematic, what's, how is he, okay, what's he doing here? Okay, now when we get to the next part, we've got to figure out how the next part builds upon the previous part. If you, if you get one part of the system wrong, So that requires what? Careful thinking. So that's a warning right there. Now you would read that in your dictionary and probably go past that so quick you didn't even catch it. That's like red light, hermeneutical, you know, warning. All right. we'll, We'll have to see if this proves to be true. Again, this is what they claim. We'll have to see if it proves to be true. All right. Uh, They claim that the main theme of Romans is that righteousness comes as a free gift of God and is receivable by faith alone. And what did I say about that? There's a little bit of an interpretation going on because they're interpreting their understanding of Romans to be which interpretation of Romans? The Protestant interpretation of Romans. I could get 500 Catholic commentaries who would strongly disagree with some of these ideas. Okay, And many of those Catholic writings would predates the existence of the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> okay, So we would have to go back and see. Does that make sense? So what, what did we agree upon this morning? That we know this. Because it's a part of the Bible, it's going to reveal what? God, us, and the world. Okay? And salvation. Right? So that, we can agree upon that. All right? And obviously when you get into who God is, righteousness is going to be involved. Right? Salvation. Well, we're going to have, we know that's going to have something to do with faith. Right? Okay? So we know that there is at least some truth to that because every part of the Bible reveals some of those things. So we can agree on that. Does that make sense? All right, that's the best we can do. We'll have to go uh, further into it. All right, any problems there? Roman stands as the head of the Pauline epistles because it is the longest of his letters. I don't have a problem with that because being longer is a factual statement, Correct. So, they'll say it's it's at the head of the Pauline epistles because it's longer. I don't have a problem with that. Next part. But it is also Paul's most... I don't agree with that. The dictionary claims it's the most important. No. What would we put instead of important? 
foundational. Foundational. I believe it is a foundational book in understanding the doctrine of salvation. I think we can even argue that. It's foundational. Foundational doesn't mean more important. It means foundational, okay? Okay? And the reason we can't... Why, why am I so hesitant to label one book more important than another? Because you begin to downplay the importance of other books of the Bible. And we know what our tendency is. If, one, if you tell me one is less important, then what are you probably going to do? We, many people look for every reason not to read, not to study. We don't need a reason not to study God's word. We have enough problems with that as it is, okay? We need to understand every single word is important. Every single word. Because it all comes from the same source, and we believe that to be God guiding the, the human authors to write as God moved them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Agreed? Okay. Now, let's go to the next part. Everybody ready? Repeatedly. In its history, the church has found in this epistle a catalyst for reform and new life. Now, stop right there. Pastors love this. They will get ready to begin a study on the book of Romans, right? And then in their introductory sermon, they pull out all kinds of stories right? Here was this church somewhere and it was falling apart and attendance had dropped to 10 and they studied the book of Romans and now they have 800 people and they almost use it this idea that, hey, if you study the book of Romans, it's going to fix everything, right? That, those, are, those, are, those are the kinds of stories pastors love to tell, uh, but here's the only problem with it. For every church where that supposedly happened, and again, sometimes I don't even give you enough evidence to even be able to verify if it did happen, Okay, but I can also probably find churches where they study the book of Romans and they had a church split. Because you're dealing with absolutely controversial things. So, uh, you know what? You know what's the catalyst to reform and uh, new life? Say it. Salvation is the catalyst to reform. Okay, regeneration is the catalyst. Okay, regeneration, salvation. All right, but God's word is uh, is key to that. As well. But that's all of God's word. You can't just say, well, you know, Romans is the catalyst. And why do they want to say it's a catalyst to reform? Because of Luther citing of the book of Romans for the Protestant Reformation, all right? That's why they want to say it. Okay, great. Um, again, for every, for, every, for every Luther who used it and quote-unquote reformed everything, others have used it to create nothing but schism, division, and chaos in the church. Because I'm telling you, we're going to get to sections, and there'll be people listening online who'll get mad, and there'll be people here who'll get mad. It's just... I mean, we, whenever we got to eschatology, it created controversy, did it not? Right? So, I mean, come on. I mean, like, well, let's not even pretend that, uh, I, again, sometimes Christian writings just drive me crazy. They just forget reality. Like, Christian writings should not ignore hist- reality. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, this book is, da- all of scripture is dangerous, placed in the hands of unskilled, sinful people. How we approach it is going to be key. All right, so far so good. In the fourth century, a troubled young man, seeing a divine command to open the Bible and read the first passage he came to, read these words, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lasciviousness and lewdness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. In an instant, says Augustine, the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. All right, so what are they trying to say? Hey, if we'll study the book of Romans, implication, in an instant, the light of confidence will flood into your heart and all the darkness of doubt will be dispelled. Okay, God may have used the book of Romans and the life of Augustine that led to this, but... That doesn't make it somehow like, you see, see, it almost makes it like, well, then say that's the book you need. God can use, Spurgeon was supposedly uh, saved. um, It was a a snowy, like it was snow everywhere. And uh, there was a little church and uh, Spurgeon shows up. 
um, the way the story goes, uh, you know, how much is myth, how much is legend. And uh, the pastor couldn't make it. Um, so there was just a, a man, he may have been a deacon, and he had, a, um, he had the book of Isaiah open where it says, you know, look to the Lord, look to, the Lord to be saved, right? And so uh, he stands up. And uh, he looks to Spurgeon, who's there, and he says, look to the Lord, young man. Look to the Lord and be saved. And then Spurgeon was saved and, well, became one of the, considered one of the greatest preachers in, you know, history, right? Well, that was the book of Isaiah. So does that make Isaiah greater than Romans? See, like, that's just full of, you see, I, you can come up with a story for every passage of Scripture. Does that make sense, right? You can come, so I, that, these, these little anecdotes, I, I just hate these, like, okay, great, uh, you know. Augustine read Romans and God opened his eyes. Okay, it, it's all of his word. Does it make sense? And of course, we know the next story they're going to go to. What's the next story? They're going to go to Luther, right? Um, and then let's see. In the 16th century, a young monk found released from his struggles with God by claiming salvation by grace through faith. Romans 1.17, Romans 3.24. This truth caused Martin Luther to launch the greatest reform the church has ever known. I don't know about a reform. I, I, I hate to say, all right, oh, we got to get into church history. Was the Reformation a reform of the church? Okay, okay. It didn't reform anything, right? The Catholic church remained the Catholic church. To reform the church, you would have to remain into the thing that was... Okay, okay. But he, it, he didn't. He went and started a new... All right, so I, I don't really like to call it a reform. I think that that's a, you know, we call it a schism. We could call it a split. Now, some may want to argue that he reformed Christianity, right? That Christianity was under the false pretense of Catholicism and their theology. And so he reformed it, but he didn't reform the church because the church that he was a part of remained as it, it hasn't changed. Okay, it's still as it is. So, um, Well, it is. I mean, it was straight up a revolt. I mean, come on. I mean, they rebelled against all authority and acted like they had their own authority and made up their own rules. And then they started tearing down Catholic churches and killing priests. I mean, that was wonderful. So, I mean, let's not even get into all the crazy things that happened during that period of time. But um, so I don't think it was a reform so much. I think it was a split. I think it was a split and he split away and they and then, you know, crazy things took place as a result of it. Again. Did he, did, was Romans instrumental in it? Yes, I don't deny that. I don't deny it. But it, we, we, it raises the question from a, and again, you're not supposed to ask this question. Was Luther's interpretation right? Now, that's a meat question. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, now, you know, right. Be, well, my thing is, is they say you can start with, most pastors start with the presupposition that it is, and I like to start with the presupposition. Let's figure it out. And I know that that's, I know right there just makes people nervous, but why? Why? Like, we got to fit, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, was Luther right about everything? I can give you a list of things he was horribly wrong about. You, you want to you mean read some of his writings about the Jews? Okay, right? I don't think you want me to read some of, you know, his writings about the Jews because it's pretty anti-Semitic. Okay, all right. Uh, we could get into a lot of things he said that we would disagree with, correct? But, but, it, what, but here's the thing. People who don't know anything about Luther would be like, you know, they don't know anything about the Re- Protestant Reformation and there'll be some pastor in some Baptist church somewhere going, Martin Luther, he was amazing in the book of... And you're like, you disagree with his entire theology because okay? you think Lutherans are going to hell. So why do you think Luther was so great? You think he went to hell. So why do you think it was so wonderful? But when you get ready to start the book of Romans, that's a great intro. It's, it's just, it's so foolish to, do, oh, it drives me crazy. It's, it drives me crazy to do that. So here's what we can say. The book of Romans has been a catalyst to a lot of major events in the history of Christianity. Can we agree with that? All right. So that means there's something about the book that is, Worth trying to figure out. Does that is that fine? All right. All right. I know now we, we I, you know you see what happens when we start reading these things. I have to start. I go, I go crazy and get bothered. But all right. Um, he says the greatest reform the church has ever known. I don't like to call it a reform. You can see why I don't like to call it a reform. All right. 
Romans, perhaps more than any single book of the Bible, has exalted a powerful influence on the history of Christianity. I, I don't even know about that. They're saying that more than any other book? It had a powerful influence, I agree, but it didn't. I can't say it had a more powerful influence. And if it had, here's the thing. If it's true that Romans had a more powerful influence over Christianity than any other book, what does that tell you about Christianity right from the start? That we're wrong, right? Because that means we're imbalanced. We can't be influenced by one book supremely over all the others. We have to be a people who are supremely influenced by all of it, from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, we have to be people of the word, not the people of a word. Okay, we have to be the people of the entire book, not the people of a book or the people of Romans. Okay, right? that's, 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 not, that's not the way it works. Okay, does that make sense? I know that goes against everything. I know what I'm basically doing is, is destroying the way you read every introduction to the book of Romans, but this is an opportunity to try to correct some of it. Am I denying the importance of Romans? No, I'm trying to place it in a more proper light. And, and again, I can run to stories about other spiritual leaders who their influence wasn't the book of Romans. Well, you got it wrong because the most important book is supposed to be Romans. <laughs> No. You know what they need to do? Whatever, whatever book God used to bring you into salvation, that's the catalyst for you now to become a student of all of it. Because I will argue, can you understand Romans apart from Genesis? You cannot. All right? You cannot understand Romans apart from Genesis. Because Genesis lays the foundation. Does that make sense? You can't talk salvation without Genesis. Genesis establishes the whole problem, does it not? Okay. Exactly, right? Exactly. So, so I, I like to tell you, I, uh, don't like that. All right, here we go. Structure of the epistle. So that first part, that introduction to the book of Romans that the dictionary gives us, what do we call a lot of that? How would we classify that, that reading that we just did? We'll call it hype. It's hyping the book. It's like, it's trying to, it's promotion. It's promoting. Now, all that's factual, but it's, fact, it's factual to try to make you think, this is the book. It is part of God's word, so it's important. Okay, and it has played an important role in Christianity. Um, I just think even some of their structure about it seems to even misunderstand how the Reformation went down. Right, And again, I'm not against, uh, I know my criticism of the Reformation sometimes bothers people, but I criticize the Reformation for what reason? To try to be, to give us a fair perspective of history. The study of history is not to justify history, it is to understand what actually happened, the good and the bad, and the ugly, right? Uh, yes, we're going to go Clint Eastwood movies, okay, all right, all right, okay. Right, we won't even get into that movie. Okay, that would be an interesting... St- okay, but we won't get into that. Don't get me started on that movie. All right, here we go. The structure of the epistle. Now, this is key. Now, why is this key? Okay, yeah, the structure can be critical in giving us clues on how to interpret it. Now, we, do we have to agree with how they lay out the structure? No, we'll, we'll see what uh, we can do here ourselves, all right? All right, man, I thought we'd be done. Well, it's not my fault they write nonsense in here, okay? Well, why do they do this? Okay, here we go. I'm even, even afraid to read what's next. Okay, structure of the epistle. The epistle to the Romans consists of two halves, all right? Now, let's stop right here. This is literally the presupposed way you're supposed to understand Romans. All right? Everyone here has heard sermons that tell you that, right? The book of Romans is broken into two parts. Everybody can here can tell me the two parts. Doctrine, and doctrine goes from chapter 1 to 11, oh, it says 8. 
Okay, usually they go to 11. Okay, and they say there's three in between. Okay, all right. Typically, it goes this way. 1 through 11 is doctrinal in nature. We'll see how they put it together. And then 12 starts the, what they call practical. All right, that's the general agreed upon structure. They're going to, I know why they're going to set aside, um, what is it? They set aside 9, 10 to 11, 9, 10, 11. I wonder why, okay? Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder why they're going to set 9, 10, 11 apart. I wonder why, okay? You talk about, that's the section you're like, let's just ignore 9, 10, 11 because chaos, because Israel's going to show up all over here. And what else? Doctrine of election. Oh, man, you got, those chapters, you just want to, pastors want to skip over them, okay? Um, our pastor in Nebraska, who, who was, you know, verse by verse, when he got to these sections, it was funny how fast he got past them, because he did not like the doctrine of election. And it's like, well, what happened? Well, why didn't we speed up so fast? Okay, I wonder why, okay? Yeah, um, you can't, you don't speed up when you don't like it. In fact, what should you do? Slow down and let it make you uncomfortable, all right? You, you have to do that, okay, And because it's difficult. But the reason pastors do it is because they don't want to cause a church split. Because you can't win. It's, again, it's the no-win test in Star Trek. You can't win. You can't win. If when, I, when we get to that subject about election, the way I'm going to try to approach it, I'm going to make reformed people mad. I'm going to make non-reformed people mad. Because I am not going to be bound to what? I'm not going to be bound to a system. I'm going to be bound to the text. Do I ignore the systems? No. But I am bound to a text, not to a system. Okay? And and guess what? Reformed people preach the the text in light of their system. Non-reformed people preach these texts in light of their system and at some point we got to be where are the people who study the bible okay Uh, those chapters are going to be difficult so understand that almost everyone divides it into two halves almost everyone does so i'm not going to argue right now against that because i think it does i think there's a good argument for it but what we need to do is figure out what we see does that make sense and, and we'll, but we won't ignore this idea let's see what they have to say here the epistle to the romans consists of two halves a, doc, a doctrinal section, chapters 1 through 8. A practical section, chapters 12 through 16. Separated by three chapters on the place of Israel and the history of salvation. All right, 9 through 11. They say the place of, Is, the place of Israel, right, Israel's place in salvation. Okay, that's what they claim, all right? That, that, that's, that's making kind of an argument, is it not? All right, um, let me just look really quick at something. Yeah, that's interesting the way they do that. Let's 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 go ahead and write this structure down, okay? Um, we're gonna keep it. In, I'm gonna keep it in the back of my mind. My mind's already ready to jump to nine through eleven to, to try to work this out. But we can, we're gonna be like we're eight years away from getting there. But let's write, go ahead and write this structure down, okay? Um, the book is broken into two halves: doctrinal, practical. The doctrinal, according to them, goes from chapter 1 to chapter 8. The practical goes from chapter 12 to 16. And three chapters, they say, deal with Israel's place in salvation. Is that the way they word it? Israel's place in the history of salvation. Is that the right way? In the history of salvation. All right. The place of Israel in the history of salvation. Okay. Now, what, what do you think my mind is doing right now? Yeah, my problem is if, if the first sentence of this book, of the dictionary, says that the bio, that book of Romans is formal and systematic, and you take three chapters... Yeah, that, that seems to destroy the systematic approach, right? That seems to be these three chapters don't fit in somehow. Okay. Okay. Right. Do I? I, 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 well, I don't want to, I can't speak to motive, but it does seem, does everyone agree it seems weird? 
Now, don't we agree it seems weird? Because to me, Israel's place in the history of salvation is about as doctrinal as doctrinal can be. There's doctrinal implications to this. There's doctrinal implications. Because Israel's place in salvation seems to have a lot to do with who, uh, who else's salvation. <laughs> Ours! Okay, so I, I, I don't like... Go ahead and let's separate it. We're, I think we're going to make an argument that it belongs in the doctrinal part. I don't think it should be separated. I don't believe it should be. But, that's, but guess what? Right now, that's being spoken of in an unskilled way because we're going to have to work through one through eight. And then when we turn to nine, I may go, you know what, let's rip this out because it doesn't make sense. Okay? Or I may say, have we proven our point? Okay. It's, well, no, that it fits to one through eight. Because if you, if you separate it, then you're, dis, you're disconnecting it from one through eight. Do I want to disconnect it from one through eight or is the argument made through one through eight critical to the argument in 9 through 11. Does that make sense? Okay. It should. That, that, it seems to imply to me, it's just weird. That, that's a weird way of handling it. I don't know if, every, if all books do that way, but we will see. But go ahead and write it down their way. So let's, let's make sure we got this. The epistle of Romans is broken into two halves. What are the two halves? Doctrinal and practical. They outline it. 1 through 8 is the doctrinal. 12 through 16 is the Practical and nine through eleven is a discourse, a study on Israel's place in the history of salvation. Okay, right. Well, we'll go along with it. We'll see, because we can't say yet, right? We we can't be dogmatic because what have we not done? I haven't studied it. So I mean, to to start making, to, if we make too many assumptions and we we're, we're speaking from an unskilled perspective, we got to work through this. All right. The writers of the uh, we'll give the writers of the uh, dictionary some some leeway here, right? Now we we may come back and prove them wrong, or they may prove us wrong. We'll be see other issues they've talked about in history. I, I mean, I've studied history enough that I can argue against some of that. But here I want to be very careful because if I start arguing against it now, what am I forcing? Presupposition onto the text. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give them the uh, the ability to give us a idea and then we're going to tear into it and now the problem is it's going to take 10 years to get there so we'll probably forget that by the time but we'll see all right any problems with this all right paul declares his main theme in the first chapter that the gospel is the power of salvation to everyone believes romans chapter 1 16 through 17 now stop right there all right I have read, I lost count. I don't even know how many things I've read on Romans um, this week. I, I will go with this. This seems to be a common idea that the, the key verse or the theme verse is Romans 1, 16 through 17. That does seem to be a, a, constant, a constant idea. Um, so I hate to go against it, but I'm, I'm, I, it's hard for me to say yet. Does that make sense? It's hard for me to say. But Romans 1, 16 through 17, let's say a lot of people definitely believe it's a key passage. They believe it's a key passage. So we will, we will have to look and, and see what they say here. Um, just keep this idea of main theme in the back of your mind because we're gonna, I'm going to give you something to do, um, and you'll, you'll see why here in a minute, all right? Um, Paul declares his main theme in the first chapter that the gospel is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. This declaration is then held in suspension until 321 while Paul, while Paul digresses to show that all people are in need of salvation. The Gentiles have broken the law of conscience and the Jews the law of Moses. Paul then returns to his opening theme in a classic statement of the Christian gospel. He explains that righteousness comes by the grace of God through people's trust in the saving work of Christ. The example of Abraham testifies that the promise of God is realized through faith. Uh, the benefits of justification are peace and confidence bef before God, Romans 5, 1 through 11. Thus, Christ's ability to save is greater than Abraham's ability to corrupt. Now, let me stop right here. Oh, Adam. Did I say Abraham? Okay, I'm saying Adam. All right. I want you to disregard all of that. And here's the reason why. Now they're not going into structure. What are they going into? Summary. They're summarizing sections. Now what's dangerous about that? 
You're give, they're giving you what they want you to see in the section. And so this begins to uh, create a presuppositional bias to the text. And you're like, well, I don't really understand this. What did the dictionary say this section was about? Right? So they're not get, are, they, are they giving you a structural basis here? They're just giving you what? They're just going through each section telling you what, what it's about. All right? I, so I, I, we're going we're gonna to just dismiss all of that. All right? We're going to dismiss all of that. Okay, because all of this is they're they're not giving me any structure. The only structure they the only structural part in this entire section is it's broken into two halves and three chapters. They separate everything else. There is them summarizing what they believe it to be teaching. They're co- they're they're using they're they're commenting. They're not explaining structure. Everybody got that? All right. So we're going to disregard all of it. Right? Just take a big pencil and cross it. Okay, don't do that. Okay. Right? But you, you get the eye. You see why? In our mind. Right? In our mind. Strike it from the record. Now, what can we do? When we're working on the section, we can come back and reference it as a commentary. Right? But we don't want to read the commentary before we read the text. Right? Now, now we need to get to authorship, we need to get to historical setting, theological uh, contribution, special considerations. But we can't, because we're out of time. So this is what I'm going to do. Where do I have it? Let me see. Oh, I hope it's saved. Because I did this last minute. Let me pull it up. i got to find it. Yes, I got it. Okay. Go ahead, uh, just find a blank sheet of paper. All right. <clears throat> you ready? Okay. We're going to begin a study to the book of Romans. Now, we still got to finish our overview. All right. We may finish the overview on Wednesday, maybe. Okay. Or we'll use Wednesday for a devotional message. We'll see. Once we get done with the overview, or you can start now, then it's going to be absolutely, if we're going to accomplish anything, you have to become readers of the book of Romans. All right? You've got to start reading it. Now, here's the good thing. This is a good thing and this is a bad thing. The good thing is you've probably got 20 years to finish it. The bad thing, I'm not joking because it's going to take forever to get through. You, th- you think we're going to get done with this quick. This, is, this book is so complicated. We're not. All right? But the negative thing is because it's so going to take so long that people are just going to say, well, then I'll just read it at some point. And when you put off what you can do today, Till tomorrow, you put off what you're going to do forever. So either you're going to do it now, or you're not going to get it done. Because usually when we put something off, what do we end up doing? Not doing it. Come on, we're all guilty. Come on. Don't act like you're all spiritual, right? When you can do it now, and you're like, well, you know, it, no, it just doesn't happen. So you need to start reading the book of Romans. Now, here's the key. I want you to read the whole book five times. I would love for you to, right? I would love for you to. I don't know if I can get anyone to accomplish that. The reason I want you to read the whole... Oh, here, I know what you can do. <laughs> I know what you can do. You, there's this little cool thing called the VBC66 app. I hear that it's really good. And if you go down to the bottom and tap on Bible and go up to the top and hit Romans and then hit the little speaker, it will read it to you. Wow, okay, that's pretty cool, right? So um, if you'll just listen to the book of Romans a lot... Just listen to it a lot, over and over and over, maybe while you're going to sleep, maybe while you're driving, I don't care what you're doing, and listen to it over and over and over and over and over. Guess what will start happening? Structure will start becoming apparent. Information will start being retained. And, and then we can start trying to figure out what is really going on. Does that make sense? But what I need you to do is do your best to start, so start listening to it as much as you can if you can't read it. But try to work on reading the first chapter. Okay, Romans 1. And as you read each chapter, as you listen to things I may post about the book, as you listen to me preach about the book, I want you to be trying to find the following things. So on a piece of paper, you need, <clears throat> you need to do this for the conclusion of each chapter in the book of Romans. 
You ready? At the conclusion of each chapter, when I'm done preaching, right, you may, already have your, you may have already filled this out because of your reading, but what I want you to be able to answer at the conclusion of each book, of each chapter of the book of Romans, the following. What is the theme of the chapter? What is the theme of the chapter? All right. Now, is that always going to be easy? No, it's not going to always be easy. Okay, especially with Paul. I mean, Paul's writing sometimes. He's like, "What are you doing, man? Okay, where are you going with this?" Okay, but sometimes it should be pretty clear. Guess what is also going to occur? Are we always going to agree on what the theme of the chapter is? Remember, in, remember in, uh, when we were going through Revelation, and y'all would give me your outlines, and I would sit here and go, "What in the world? What book are y'all reading?" Right? I'd be like, is that the same book? Okay. And so I'd have to redo the outline, right? Because I was like, what? Okay, right? But because many times you were trying to do what? Interpret the chapter. And my outlines typically try to do what? Observe the chapter. Maybe there's a big difference. So uh, you're going to have to try to observe what the theme is. You're not going to try to interpret the theme. You have to observe the theme. Do you know the difference? Observing the theme means you're deriving the theme from the contents of the book, not your interpretation of those contents. And guess how you determine the contents of the chapter? Frequent reading of it. Until you're pretty, like you can make go, you may have to say theme of the chapter. I have three possible. Right? I have two possible. That's okay. Just write down what you think the theme of the chapter is. Number two. What, what you think the possible most important verse is. Now, what do you think the most important verse would be tied to? The theme! The theme. Oh man, this church is filled with geniuses. Yes, it was going to possibly be tied with the theme. All right, now, man, I should have brought it um, someone I know, he's been reading, uh, he's been reading a book, how to read a book and get the most out of it. I can't remember what it. And uh, he constantly sends me, uh, things from it going, this reminds me of you. This reminds me of you. This reminds me of you. Right. Because I like, I've like pretty much lived what this book teaches. Right. And it gets into this whole idea that most people can't figure out what the most important word is. Um, because they don't know how to find out what the most important word is in a text, because they don't know how to read. Okay, and so I, w- I may bring it because it's just fascinating, kind of the argument the book makes that you really don't know how to figure it out. Um, and he's like, "Man, you, you, you! Every time I ask you, like, what the key thing is, you basically, basically, I tend to argue this all the time, right? So we'll see. But the key is here: try to find the most important verse, all right, or the most important verse." And then that will lead to the most important word. All right, so let's go through these again. The theme of the chapter, I'm trying to go quick here. The most important verse and the most important word. I kind of jumped ahead there. But the most important verse will be uh, uh, connected to what? The theme, and guess what the most important word is going to be connected to? The verse or the theme, right? Okay. And what's our typical way of finding it? Yeah, we usually look for what's repeated the most. This book kind of makes an argument against that, okay? And I could could get into a reason why, but it gets way complicated, but we'll we'll get into that. All right, so what's the theme of the chapter? What's the most important verse? What's the most important word? Next, what does it teach us about God? What does it teach us about God? Now, that implies what? The Father, the Son, the Son. Or the Holy Spirit. What does it teach us about God? What do you learn about God in the chapter? I, what is this starting to sound like? Chapter seven. Chapter seven. <laughs> yeah, because I never let you get away from that, right? Okay. All right. What does it teach you about God? Next. What do you think? Are there any commands you need to obey? Oh wow, that's. Uh, I wonder where I'm getting this idea. What commands do you need to obey? If there's commands there, you've got to figure out how you're going to obey them, right? You've got to acknowledge that. Next, 
What do you think? Well, what promises are there to consider? And please note, I didn't say promises to claim. Promises to consider. Why? Because not all promises are applicable to us. Some promises are conditional. Some promises are non-conditional. So you've got to consider the promise and figure out all of those things. Next, is there a new truth you learned well, by the time we finish the chapter? Something new that you did not realize before? Something, did it change a previous teaching? Did you learn something new? Change something old? That's the basic idea. It was a new truth learned. And then what do you think the last one is? Or no, two, I got two more to go. What are the key lessons of the chapter? Key lessons to meditate on. When you're done with the chapter, you should have key lessons. How many? There's no set number. How many is in the chapter? How many key lessons can you derive from the chapter? There may be three, there may be four. Now you want to, you may be able to get ten, but you want to limit, limit them to at least a, a small key. These are key lessons, not every lesson, key lessons. And these are then give you, why? Because if I can remember the basic theme and the basic lessons of the chapter, then I've built in a knowledge base that will help me when I'm studying in the rest of the part of the, oh, oh wait, remember in Romans? There was, there was a key lesson here. Wait, that doesn't go with it. It, it helps you all, all the way through. And then what would be the last? Applications. Applications. How, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Now you know Romans 1. What are you going to do? Are you going to do anything? Well, I know Romans 1. That's irrelevant. What are you going to do now? At the conclusion of each chapter... We've got to try to work on these. Now, I'm going to try to do it for you. So that means at the end of each chapter, we're going to have probably a sermon that's going to be very practical, very applicable, and very break this down. Now, you may look at me and go, I thought the key theme was this. And then we may have to turn it into six months, me proving your theme is wrong. Okay, but but if I need to do that, I will do that. That still could be beneficial, could it not? Or I may go, wait, Bobby, that's... Okay, Bobby may be right. Okay, maybe, now we're going to do six months to correct what I thought, okay? But whatever the case may be, because no, sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. Um, so we have to look at it. So let's go through these again. When we f- finish a chapter in the book of Romans, I want you to be able on your own, and the key is on your own first, because then it makes this journey that much more meaningful. I want you to have on paper, what is the theme of the chapter? What is the most important verse? What is the most important word? What did it teach you about God? What commands are there that you need to obey? What promises are there for you to consider? What new truth that there is there that you've learned? Are there what key lessons are there for you to meditate on? And what applications you need to start living out? Now we could look for sins, obviously, in there as well. We could look for sins as there as well. But you get I didn't want to make it too too detailed. I want to make it pretty simple and straightforward. Most of that's easy stuff. Is that going to require like 10 dictionaries and a a seminary education in Greek? No. It just requires you to do what? Just read the chapter. Just read the chapter. Just read the chapter. All right. Now I know we didn't get far in our introduction, but that's okay. What's the key thing about the introduction that we've gotten probably? What's probably the key lesson that we can take away tonight? Key lesson is this. Number one, avoid the hype that some pastors and books give to every book they get ready to teach because they, they almost make you think one book is more important than another and you see why that's dangerous. All right. Number two, probably the next key thing is they give us an important structure and their important structure is there's two halves and part of this is doctrinal and part of this is practical. Right? Now, why is that important? Why is it important to note that? Okay, you'll be looking for it. Well, it's always important to kind of know what you're getting yourself into from a hermeneutical perspective. How I interpret a 
doctrinal section may be very different how I'm interpreting a practical section. Doctrinal section, I've got to be concerned with what? Okay, wait. Okay, what's the doctrine here? I've got to establish what the doctrine is, right? I've got to establish what he appears to be teaching, and then what do I immediately have to consider? How does what appearing to be taught here connects to the rest of the Bible's teaching on the same subject? And is there differences? How do I reckon? Like, like I'm going into a very hermeneutical frame of mind going, this is a doctrinal section. When I get to the practical section, well, one, I got to figure out how the doctrinal gives rise to the practical. And then, I, but the practical way, I'm trying to think more about, okay, are these practical lessons specifically for the people he was writing to? Right? There's a lot of practical stuff going on in Corinth, right? Offering meat unto idols. Right, that, that's practical, but that takes a little bit out of my realm a little bit, right? Because I'm not offering any meat unto idols, correct? Okay, and I'm not eating meat that's offered unto an idol. So now I've got to go, okay, wait a minute. I've got to understand this practical in light of its historical, but now I've got to figure out how it may be applicable to... That's a whole different way of doing it, a hermeneutics versus a doctrinal. Does that make sense? So uh, if you don't understand the style, the type, the genre... You can't interpret it. So we got, So that's why the structure is important. It's giving us a little key. All right. Any questions? No. All right. So just, I mean, you don't have any major thing to do. Just start reading Romans, listening to Romans. And here, I would love for people to do this. If you're reading, you've got a question, please, if you don't want to talk to me, talk to Stacy. Okay. And give her your questions, okay? Because those questions are, wh- why do you think those questions are so important? Because I'm like, oh, 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 okay. So there's some questions here. I will emphasize this. I will focus on this. It will, it will literally direct my preaching. Yeah, I, I guess Protestants don't have to ask questions. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah, maybe that's it. Okay, all right. But ask, I mean, I, I, sometimes when y'all don't ask questions, I'm like, man, maybe, maybe they're smarter than me because I like, when I read Romans like verse one, I'll just start with verse one. What, what's the first word? Paul a, no, a servant. Now I got a million problems. I can, I can give you, how many questions do you want? Is Paul understanding a servant a Hebrew understanding of a servant or a Roman in- interpretation of a servant? Massive difference. I got 18 commentaries that tells me he's using servant in a Hebrew understanding of a servant, and I got 18 commentaries that says he's using servant in a Roman understanding. So guess what? They interpret the word servant. So right there, the third word, the third word, there's division in the church. Now, that should be a question. How is he using the term servant? Nobody will ask that question, and I'll be thinking, am I the only one struggling with this? Okay, I read an entire article today about this, and, and they were like, well, you know, I think it's this, and I think it's that. I, I think. I'm like, well, if nobody can agree on how he's using it, then what am I supposed to do when I preach it? I don't know. We'll probably just skip it. Okay. I don't know. So... But do you see what I'm saying? Like, if you ask that question, then I'm like, okay, good. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one confused here. Okay, because that one's a difficult. That changes what Paul's saying about himself. Hebrew servant, far different than a Roman servant. They're not even within the same ballpark. Okay, night and day. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this evening. Lord, we, we're, we're not even really out. We haven't even gotten to the door to open the door to even begin this journey through the book of Romans, but we are laying hopefully a good foundation and a good framework. And I'm hope I'm also trying to give everyone here skills and how to read uh, Christian reference tools, how to, how to know when they're giving you a fact versus giving you an opinion when they're, uh, when they're, and, and it's hard Lord to try to do these kinds of things because I know it slows us down from getting to maybe where we want to go, but they are important. And I pray that we would do that. I, I don't know how long we're going to be in the book of Romans, Lord. I just pray that we will all in this room do our best to just try to make this the most profitable study we've had in a very long time. 
And I pray that we will all do the work that is required. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people say, Amen. Well, you have been listening to another episode of Theology the Central you Radio. Just heard was made using. Okay, there we go. There was there there was an advertisement there at the end. Okay, that's when we we're using the Anchor podcasting platform. That goes back to a long time. Well, I mean, back to 2019, and we were using the Anchor podcasting platform, and they 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 gave you that that little intro, that intro and outro music, which is awesome, but then at the end, they were like, this podcast was created using the Anchor podcasting platform. If you would like to create a podcast, something along those lines. So I was wondering why there was more time left, but yeah, that's what that was from. So you were just listening to an episode of Theology Central Radio, where I go grab something from the archives, that was May the 6th, 2019, and we were working on the Book of Romans, kind of our introduction to the Book of Romans. And whenever I listen to my introductions, I almost laugh at myself now. I laugh at myself because I always, I'm always so naive, right? I, I was always, I don't know the word, you could just say foolish Maybe I was over, I was hopeful, but I always have a like, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. We're all going to be reading the book of Romans and you're going to be asking questions and I'm going to be answering questions and you're going to be, you're going to have notebooks and you're going to be doing this for each chapter and you're going to be looking for these things and you're going to do this and you're going to do this and we're all going to work together and it's going to be amazing and everybody's going to be talking about the book of Romans and discussing the book of Romans and, and calling me about the book of Romans and it's going to be this great study and discussion and it's going to be amazing. All right, everybody ready? And then, you know, about, I don't know, sometimes it feels like, looking back, sometimes it feels like by the next week, no one's, you already realize no one's going to do what you're asking anyone to do. And then you just kind of say, why am I putting forth all of this time and all of this effort? Why did I give 70 something minutes trying to get everyone to participate when it was an absolute waste of time. It would have been just, it, it, yeah. So sometimes it's frustrating. It, it's funny because you're like, man, you never learned. You never caught on. You never caught 23 years later. If you get ready to start a new book, you would be doing this. All right, we're going to do this. 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 And then you just kind of realize it's always going to fall apart. But a lot of what fell apart there was, that was May the 6th, 2019. Who knew what was going to happen in 2020? Who could have predicted what was going to happen in 2020? And then everything in that study just kind of fell apart. It, it did in so many ways. It's so frustrating. Uh, but even if it wouldn't have fallen apart, what you originally attempt to do... And and all I can say is I think that this is a, we I mean we could have a long discussion here. It's the never ending battle of kind of what what do the people in the pew actually want? Not not what they say they want. What do they actually want? And then what? How does the people behind the pulpit? Do you just give the people what they want? Because not not what they say they want, because what they say they want really, I don't think is really what they want, because I think some just want to come to church, get get a sermon. Not They, they may want a decent sermon, but they don't really want to do anything else. And so, and then it's like, well, how much can you actually accomplish? If people just show up for a sermon on a Sunday morning and they're not going to do anything else, they're not going to read, they're not going to study, they're not going to... How much are they actually going to take away from it? Because again, all the studies say they're not even going to remember that sermon by the next Sunday. So, And when you do review questions the next week, you find out really quick how much they've already forgotten. So then you're like, okay, so what are we really accomplishing here? And it, it does raise lots of questions. But hope you enjoyed that trip back to May the 6th, 2019. For this episode of Theology Central Radio, thank you so much for tuning in. Everyone have a great day. You can always email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. We may do another episode of Theology Central Radio today. I don't know what we're going to do today, but as always, have your notifications on if you're using the Church One app, and uh, you'll get notified when we go live. All right, thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.